Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Mike. Uh, and this is a very good introduction. It saves me time because I even removed the slide about me from, from the presentation. And I'll just directly jump to the contents. So today we're be, going to be talking about sharing cyber threat intelligence. First, an intro, what is cyber threat intelligence? You probably know, you might think you know, but hopefully you will learn a bit more. Uh, what are the challenges of sharing uh, CTI? It's more short for cyber threat intelligence. And then one example, and, and the, the examples that I'll be providing here in the use case, it, it's, it's based on true stories, so to say, but of course many details are, are um, abstracted away. And so, first we're going to talk about a kind of a naive example, uh, naive but still very useful, of, of sharing um, a CTI with confidential computing. And then another example which is more um, work in progress but also ha has very concrete applications about more privacy preserving aspects of, uh, of sharing CTI. And then, of course, some thoughts about the road ahead. So, what is CTI? So, it, it you might be straightforward to think that it's like, okay, it's, it's some sort of specific uh, information about attacks and so on, but that it's actually a very broad concept and very nebulous, just data. So, uh, specifically cyber threat intelligence, it's a subset of threat intelligence, so threat intelligence is a very broad domain. But here, in this case, we we're specifically focusing on digital threats and cybersecurity, so we don't care about physical uh, threats and so on. And normally it, it includes a whole lot. It includes like anything from very detailed things like network logs and, and activity logs, uh, like about processing running on individual workstations, servers, networks, and so on, uh, malware reports. It also contains all sorts of unstructured information from uh, hacker fo fo forums, um, all sorts of reports from government agencies and, and other agencies. So it's a whole lot, and it's a funnel. So all the way uh, from all the way from the top, very unstructured information, discussions, ideas, gossips, and so on, all the way down to specific um, I don't know uh, processes running on a specific workstation, uh, and. It, it, is, it can be used in different ways. It can be used to kind of understand the trends. Uh, it can also be used to understand the tactics, techniques uh, that uh, adversaries or specific attackers are, are using today, are developing, are working on, and so on. And it also allows to identify um, quickly enough the, the specific malware strains, the vulnerabilities, and known exploits. So just like... Um, I don't know, uh, viruses in the, in the real world, in the biological viruses that attack us. Malware also evolves all the time, but this time it's like people actually working, um, working uh, actively to, to evolve them. So that's actually where the similarity ends. So uh, in most cases, uh, this kind of data involves sensitive either personal data or business critical data, which makes the whole subject really touchy. Uh, and also because in many cases, uh, cyber threats either indicate that a specific attack has happened or when was successful perhaps, and then nobody wants to really talk about that, or uh, you know, some, some enterprise or some organization has been targeted, even that is additional information. So it's really, really difficult to, to work with this. Uh, and so, but in the same time, we, organizations need to share this and need to, you know, collect this from others and share and so on because this helps prepare, um, you know, incident response, uh, helps them be ready, helps improve their capabilities and, and so on, and also eventually reduce the impact of uh, cyber incidents when, uh, when bad things actually happen. Uh, and so also knowing emerging threats um, helps them make informed decisions instead of just saying like, okay, let's uh, you know, keep investing in cybersecurity endlessly. <laughs> Nobody ever said that. Uh, but at least this helps argue why specific measures that need to be taken and so on, given the, the trends and the developments in, in, in uh, let's say, in new malware uh, strains. And so uh, it's an ever-evolving threat, as I said. Things are not static. Things change from day to day. And so that's why organizations, even though they're they even 
competing perhaps, so there's all sorts of security organizations, they might be competing, but they also need to collaborate. And then there's even another model where there might be Mm, I don't know, organizations that are not directly competing, such as, let's say, the region of uh, Bilbao, uh, or actually the Basque country, I don't know the exact region here. And then another region in a different country might want to exchange uh, information about what is actually happening to their networks, because if, if there's an attack you know, on, on, uh, on a public administration in Spain, there might be a similar attack coming up in Belgium or Italy or any other country. But then you, here you come to a different type of uh, you know, um, difficulties because then this means transferring potential uh, personal information over uh, borders, which adds a whole lot of new challenges. Uh, so, it's, so sharing uh, CTI is far from straightforward. In the same time, it's really, really necessary. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah, organizations prefer to keep it secret uh, because this often risks damaging the public images. Nobody wants to look uh, like they had uh, some sort of incident. They prefer to keep things nice and easy. Uh, and of course, there are a number of standards and there's a, a bunch of projects uh, to make uh, CTI sharing easier, but it's far from guaranteed that they are actually, you know, always applicable because as I said, there are it's, it's a problem that is difficult to solve not only technically. It's not only about the, the data model of specific, you know, how do you share this information. And for that you have this uh, OASIS defined standards. But it's also about other aspects, uh, uh, about data protection, about getting the, the okay from the data protection officer in the organization to share this potentially uh, business critical or personal information across organizational borders, across national borders, it all becomes like a multi-dimensional problem, which is different from other, let's say, uh, settings when you, you have the, I don't know, a bunch of uh, IoT sensors and you need to protect uh, that data from, from uh, adversaries. Uh, and then, of course, now everybody talks about AI and machine learning. And the, the issue with this is that this really helps improve things uh, because um, the issue so far with, with the threat intelligence analysis is that it's, it's a human issue. It's, it needs to be or, um, analyzed by humans, by SOC operators, like um, security operations centers operators. And the big, single biggest issue with that is burnout. People just get burned out. There's like so much information they need to react really fast and so on. It's still necessary, but then of course you have uh, machine learning and deep learning to to help uh, help that as a tool and perhaps reduce the amount of information and help their decision. So it's, it's a very good uh, decision support tool. The thing with it is that given that the, the threat is ever evolving, they need a lot of data all the time. So this even further highlights the need to share data. And sharing data is difficult, as I mentioned, until now. So in, 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 in summary, so sharing big amounts of CTI data is complex. Why? So first of all, data is heterogeneous. There's all this stack from, from uh, let's say, process information all the way to like discussions on all sorts of forums. Uh, potentially, it's very sensitive. It's business sensitive. It's personal information sensitive, and so on. Uh, there are, of course, always commercial uh, offerings. Say, like, okay, just like you know, combine. Um, upload all your data here and share in our big data warehouse, lake, whatever. However, they rely on blind trust. You just close your eyes, like, yes, yeah, sure, things are good. Uh, of course, they can also rely on very long uh, legal negotiations uh, that are absolutely unenforceable uh, because you can never ever actually prove something went one way or another. So in, in that case, only, only um, uh, well, legal, um, legal stuff wins because they, they, they get a lot of budget. Or in some other cases, nothing is happening. And then we get less information. We don't know what's happening. We cannot keep up with the, with the new tactics of the adversaries. So in brief, the way I see it right now, there are no good solutions. There are workarounds. There are better or worse workarounds, but it's all workarounds. Quite often, like blind trust is the winner. Like we see blind trust all, all everywhere. And so, if we look at it on, on a higher level, uh, let's, let's imagine, so, like, there's some sort of, like, hospital or whatever, a provider of, uh, of uh, network logs, or, like, the public administration of the city of Bilbao. Uh, they need to 
they, they need to collect information from their networks and so on, and they do that, but they don't really obviously have the expertise to, to extract threat intelligence from that. And they collaborate usually with some sort of a security provider, with a managed security service, and so on. Uh, and here we care about the, um, we care about privacy because in many cases, uh, or in most cases, let's say they they have some sort of monitoring tools on their workstations, on their networks, uh, and these monitoring tools are installed on the let's say laptops or workstations of, of individual employees. And if you are able to see all the processes that are running, all the tabs that are open and so on, well, it kind of contains very sensitive information, you know, who's surfing on Facebook instead of working and so on. So it's, it's very touchy. You cannot just like send it over to a managed security service uh, provider potentially located in a different country. And here we, we care about uh, the, the collection phase. So we, we, we care about input privacy uh, when, when the data is collected, what kind of data is collected, and then it's somehow processed. We, right now we abstract from like where it's processed, who is processing. It's somehow anonymized, and I put it in quotes because anonymization is such a topic that, yeah, uh, it's, it's, yeah, there's, we, we could call it pseudo-anonymization. And then there's the sharing uh, phase, which is more about the output privacy. What do you release what kind of views or what kind of queries do you allow and what kind of uh, views of, of data you allow based on, on, on the processed information. And this uh, really, like the, the, let's say, uh, the setup and how this is sold really depends on where the organizational boundary is. Is all this uh, processing and pre-processing and, and pseudonymization happening on the, uh, on the side of the uh, managed security service or on the side of the uh, data owner service. And so here this, this organization boundary can be shifting and depending on this setup you have very very different um, trust relations. And I know we have a trust machine trust expert in the, in the room. I'm reading your book right now Mike. Um, and this, this really affects how, how uh, things are set up, negotiated and so on. And so how, how computational computing can be solved in, in one case? Well, of course, um, using confidential computing, we can agree that uh, a certain uh, software with a certain configuration would be processing uh, the data and then a certain, let's say, subset of information from that data would be released to the managed security service. And then both, both uh, organizations can um, verify and use some sort of attestation service in this case, well, this, the service that, that, that we have, but it could be like Project Amber from Intel or others, um, in order to validate that certain software with a certain configuration that has been whitelisted and agreed upon with certain policies and so on, is processing the, uh, the, the, the data and is releasing a certain uh, type of information that is anonymized, pseudonymized, and has been given an okay by the data protection officer. So this is, let's say, a, a simple implementation which is still useful and, and it raises the bar. And most importantly, it raises the, let's say, the, the, um, the, the chances that the managed security services provider can convince their potential customer, the, I don't know, the city of Bilbao, that, okay, they, they will not gain too much information about the, the, too much private data about the employees of the public administration, and instead they will be able to extract this valuable uh, cyber threat intelligence information. So this is, let's say, a canonical almost uh, example of, you know, using uh, confidential computing to protect, on one hand, the, uh, the data, but also potentially the, the algorithms or even like the configuration data uh, of, of, of this software. And the, the software that does the processing can be uh, proprietary, can be an open source project that has been configured in some way and so on. So yeah, here the same thing. Again, it depends on where this processing is happening. It can also be used, the same model can be used to uh, place the, this pre-processing uh, software created or configured by the managed security service provider on the network of the administration because then it would also help them reduce the, the amount of data collected because a, a big issue with, with um, 
collecting uh, cyber threat intelligence is that it's a lot of data. It's petabytes of data. They and 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 they these guys here who are you know uh, collecting and processing the uh, cyber threat intelligence. They don't need all this data. It 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 it's costly. They just you know, it's it's a lot of trouble uh, protecting it as uh, and so on. They would rather have the the you know the pure information that they need. On the other hand, if they place their potentially proprietary algorithms to detect uh, attacks on the networks of the of their customers, well, they might lose control over it because they don't trust these networks actually. So, computational computing can help in, in this sense. But then there are Okay, so this basically summarizes it. But there are uh, more complex scenarios. So in this case, the, 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 first, the first conclusion here that confidential computing is not magic, but uh, can help. And even if it helps here, there are still very complex uh, trust relationships that are still involved between the, um, between the data owner, let's say the public administration of the city of Bilbao, the managed security service provider, and whoever runs the, uh, let's say, attestation service, the policies for this attestation service, and so on. But then uh, you might have other cases, as I mentioned, where several public administrations, for example, might want to collaborate in order to collaboratively train a machine learning model uh, for, for um, uh, threat intelligence detection, uh, threat intelligence collection, and so on. And here we have uh, an example of what Sven mentioned of combining or stacking, stacking the technologies uh, of confidential computing with some other pets. Uh, and in this case, of course, uh, federated learning with uh, homomorphic encryption or secure aggregation uh, based on the homomorphic encryption helps address this. So this is. Uh, um, this is an example where the two technologies are stacked, and I'll explain very soon why we need to stack them. So the, the example here is that on the, we have two example organizations, organization one and N. We can have many, but in, you know, in this drawing there are just two. And the organizations collect these logs, and you know these logs, as I mentioned, can contain very sensitive information, and usually they do. So. Uh, and they need to be protected both due to business reasons uh, and due to personal data protection reasons. So, and then you know, diff very different people decide on these issues. Uh, and th these two organizations generally trust each other on sh on sharing um, cyber threat intelligence information, but don't really trust each other on, on, on you know, sharing data, and they cannot even trust each other. They're, they're prevented by law or by regulations from, from, trusting, uh, for sh from sharing personal information uh, simply due to GDPR and other regulations. Uh, yeah, so there are, um, there are a bunch of uh, uh, secure aggregation schemes for federated learning, and we, we went through many of them. We chose one, we found that it's, it's, it's very scalable, and then, but then it has quite a lot of constraints uh, because it only uh, supports additive operations and uh, it, 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 it has other constraints. And then we realized like, hey, actually, we don't need scalability because like many of these uh, secure aggregation schemes, especially based on, uh, for federated learning, they are um, built for scalability. But if we have, let's say, Tens of organizations. We don't care about scalability. Yeah, perfect. Speaking of tens, <laughs> uh, we don't care about scalability. We can trade scalability for, uh, let's say, uh, for performance or for other security um, properties. And so, in this case, we we designed a different uh, secure aggregation scheme. And this comes back to the point of using, um, let's say, MPC and other pets. Uh, that, that Sven was making, and, and one issue with this is that it's, it's brittle. It's brittle and it quite often needs to, to be fine-tuned to the use case and, and it's quite a lot of fiddling there. So that is a, a big challenge to their more massive adoption. But uh, in, in any case, they are very useful. However, however, this is great, but homomorphic encryption one, has one very big, massive Achilles heel, is that it only provides confidentiality. It takes good care of confidentiality, great, everything is encrypted, but integrity is not there. 
And, and this is exactly the case where you know, we also need integrity because we, we want to be able to rely on this information and, and know that not only it's protected at all times, but it's also trustworthy. That, uh, of course, the, the, the organizations might trust each other to provide correct information, but will they trust the, the aggregator, whoever runs the aggregator? How is the aggregator running it? And this is another case where uh, computational computing can help, and this is the, 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 the case for stacking up the technologies, where confidential computing can be used to, let's say, protect the aggregation service for, in, for the uh, federated learning model in this case, combined with homomorphic encryption that, that, um, that is used for secure aggregation of the model parameters. Yeah, so in, in summary or looking ahead, I would say that, well, I think there is, there is not yet the realization. I think it, it will still take time, but I think blind trust should no longer be an option. Well, I think it's still quite a lot an option, especially when we look at all the services that we use and uh, even, even enterprise services that businesses use. Blind trust is still an option, it, and it works remarkably fine. Uh, but I think the regulations that are coming up are slowly catching up with this. And, and, and especially we see regulations in different fields, in, in especially Europe is, is very much a leader in, in regulating things. Uh, but finance will, is having some, some really nice uh, regulations coming up where blind trust is no, no longer an option. And confidential computing is a really, really powerful tool. But as I mentioned before, it's not magic. Uh, it can do a lot if it's used right. It's not necessarily easy to, to use it right. Uh, and it needs to be combined well, stacked, or even uh, uh, blended with other pets. And on the other hand, protecting privacy, the, the other aspect of, of, of this talk, is, uh, is also a moving target. And this is the, the other um, you know, nice or funny or challenging aspect of, of uh, using confidential computing. It's not like we designed a solution, confidential computing, we're good. No, because even what is privacy and, and how it needs to be protected is evolving. It evolves due to regulations, it evolves due to interpretations of regulations, which is a funny, funny thing, but every, every nation state, even within Europe and elsewhere as well, of course, will have their own interpretations of this. And even the interpretation or understanding of local data protection officers in every organization you know, might evolve over time. Whatever was fine today, we just told them, like, we use confidential computing, so it's privacy. Okay, today is fine. And then tomorrow the DPO will read into the, you know, will read some, some article that was published about vulnerabilities and whatnot and say, like, no, it's not, not fine anymore. Like, you need to do more. So this is also a moving target, so which, which makes the whole um, prog problem quite challenging and fun. Uh, but it's also a, a good challenge for the confidential computing community to keep you know, evolving and, and improving and not just you know, rely on the comfortable realization that we have confidential computing, this is, uh, this is perfect, we're done. No, we're not done, but it's a very, very good uh, tool to work with. And that's, uh, that's about it. Yeah, get in touch for demo. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there's nothing fun about confidential computing. No, you know, that's very all good. Sad. All good. No. <laughs> very sad topic. Um, any questions? I'm sure there are. It's, uh, who wants to start? Because I, I, can, I can always come up with questions. I know. So, okay, you say you've, you've, you've chosen your, um, uh, your, your other PET to stack. Um, where are you with uh, choices in terms of the confidential computing uh, piece of your stack? In terms of uh, the specific what you're offering, uh, yeah. So I wonder how I should answer this question without going into details of any specific provider, because it's a very well, not provider but a vendor, uh, because a very you know vendor specific technology. But we we due to performance issues, I think this is a good uh, way. Due to performance issues, we realized that uh, we need VM based uh, solutions, and and I see this also. Basically, all the feedback that I've had through from all sorts of discussions. There are some uh, organizations that are, for whatever reason, uh, very attached to process-based. Uh, but even those realize that 
you know, I.O. is a big issue and performance is a big issue. And in, ultimately, performance trumps security in, in most use cases. And even, even no matter how stringent the security requirements, performance is still necessary. Of course, there will always be niche cases where, where uh, security will trump performance and say like, well, we, we are fine. We, we are going to use just, uh, you know, very secure, stacked or amalgamated solutions and we don't care about performance or cost. Yes, but those, those are very niche. And, uh, and that's why we saw that uh, VM-based approaches are, let's say, more accepted. So that's a, which leads me to a whole bunch of other questions that I don't think it's, it's time to go through, but I think I'm just going to raise here, which is that often when, when people come to us, the, the industry, and ask about performance, they, they think it's all about um, how fast something runs. But actually, we've had a couple of talks which talked about I.O. performance, um, and that's really, really important. And that can be internal and external off, uh, off die or wherever. So, uh, I'd love to see some more talks about those sorts of things in, in future ones with those, if anyone's interested. Um, any final questions for Nicola? Uh, I'll have my language question, if no one no else. What language are you using? Rust. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Always the correct Boring. answer. So, um, Boring. <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Rust convert. Um, excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, next is... Uh, in